Hey guys, what's up? For this video I wanted to try a new format. This is not a review, but after beating the game Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age, Definitive Edition, I wanted to highlight the game for those who haven't played it, or for those that have started but haven't completed. The reason for this type of video is that I think reviews tend to spoil your enjoyment of a game, focusing too much on the negative aspects that many people will probably not notice or consider a positive. Of course, bugs, glitches, and false promises are important to know before you purchase a game, but I personally try not to watch or read reviews until finishing the game myself, if I ever plan on playing it. So, for this video, I'll try to avoid as much spoilers as possible, but I will be discussing and showing off video of the main characters, overview of the plot, and features of the game. A lot of people like to crap on games they don't like, so this non-review will just describe things I liked about the game. If you want a review that highlights the negative parts, I'm sure you can find a lot of those on other channels, or just read the zero reviews on Metacritic. So with that, let's just jump into it. If I had to describe why I enjoy Dragon Quest XI so much in one sentence, I would say that it takes the best parts of older Dragon Quest games and is able to make it a polished, entertaining, and epic adventure for a new generation. If you haven't played a single Dragon Quest game, no problem since each game has its own separate story, but if you have, you may recognize the art style, enemies, items, music, weapon types, and much more from previous iterations. Even the running gag of Puff Puff is still loud and proudly displayed in the game, and if you don't know what that is, check out the Censored Gaming's video in the description below. There's something about Dragon Quest XI that makes it feel more like a first-party Nintendo game. In combination with the great cast of characters, the writing and the dialogue is one of my favorite parts. Each town you visit have characters who speak with different dialects, like the Spanish influence Puerto Valor. I must give credit to the devs and the localization team for hitting this one out of the park. The game is absolutely charming with beautiful environments and monster design. It's been a long time since I actually enjoyed talking to NPCs in town to hear what they had to say. At first sight, because of the bright colors and style, some may dismiss this as a kid's game, but I would best describe it as a family-friendly game that kids and all the way up to middle-aged men like myself will enjoy. I can't tell you how many times names of towns, like Sneffelheim, or characters, like Heelijah, made me laugh. There are even cows that try to predict the weather, talking monsters who aren't all evil, and the adorable spirits, Tackles, that roam around the land. These are all small things that I found a lot of humor in. The game keeps the tradition of the silent protagonist, who is voice acted as a child but as an adult doesn't voice any dialogue. Unlike Western RPGs with multiple dialogue options that generally tend to give players a false sense of choice, this game often presents you with options as a yes or no answer, but you are generally forced into one answer to progress. I'm not sure if this is some kind of meta commentary on choices in most video games, but I got a lot of pleasure out of saying the wrong answer just to see how characters would react. How can you say that? Look at this poor little creature! Have you got a stone for a heart or something? But there are a couple of standout moments where your choices do affect how a certain section of the story plays out, which caught me off guard. This game is easily up there with the best JRPGs on the market. It's an epic game in every sense of the word. My playthrough took about 60 hours and you can double that for those who are completionists. The side quests are great and offer worthwhile rewards in the form of items, crafting plans, or equipment. There's a lot of variety in these plentiful side quests, instead of the standard fetch or kill quests like most games. Some can be done just as a fun detour, while others are not as straightforward, requiring you to talk to specific NPCs and locate a specific item across the map. These reward you with better items, making it feel more worthwhile as you can always see ahead of time what the reward will be. I love story-driven games and the story here is good. It's quite traditional and involves you and a cast of colorful characters who are trying to take down an evil wizard that is plotting to take over the entire world. You are the chosen one, the one that people call the Luminary, who is prophesized to conquer this evil and bring light back to the world. Sounds familiar, but each character has their own interesting and satisfying story. Luckily, travel and many aspects of the game have been made much less punishing compared to previous installments of the franchise. You can easily zoom or quick travel out of areas and into towns or camps you previously visited. You have the option of purchasing items from a vendor or crafting equipment using the forge. With the ability to spend gold to purchase missing ingredients, this always makes you feel that gold is a valuable resource and making combat more worthwhile. Of course, the best weapons can't be forged by purchasing the missing ingredients, but it does tell you where to find each item. You can also rework items up to plus 3 in the forge to improve their stats. Except when traveling the open seas, random battles have been done away with. Enemies can be seen in the environments, and you can choose to initiate battle with them or run around them. There are a variety of different dungeons and bosses, but not as time-consuming or difficult compared to previous games. Of course, if challenge is what you're looking for, there's a lot of extra content after the game that ramps up significantly. Dragon Quest XI does endgame content right. It doesn't feel tacked on or as filler. 
it keeps up with the same quality of the main quest. You can also start the game with adjustable draconian quests. It's great that you don't have to unlock these, which traditionally might be seen as a game's new game plus content. These draconian quests help customize your playstyle, such as preventing EXP gain from weaker enemies, going straight to a game over if your main character dies in battle, or not being able to purchase items from vendors. This is just a few among many more. These can also be adjusted in-game if you change your mind later. The franchise's turn-based combat has also been adjusted, and gives you the option of traditional or the new combat system. In the new combat system, you can assign tactics to your party members to automatically attack, use spells, or focus on healing. No longer do you have to input your actions, and hope that your character doesn't die before your healer's turn. It gives you a lot of freedom on how you want to play. I chose to always input commands for my main character while letting the AI control the rest. During important battles, I would take control of all of my characters as I wanted them to use specific attacks or buffs. The new definitive edition on the Switch also includes a new 2D mode where you can play the entire game in traditional 2D glory. You can check out my other video where I took a side-by-side -side look during the first hour of the game. This is a great addition, but the game is so beautiful that you would miss out on a lot if you skipped the regular 3D version. But similar to the Draconian quests and redoing your skill points, this can also be accessed to replay certain chapters anytime by visiting a save point. With a party size of 4 and 8 total characters to choose from, you would think that half of the characters would be neglected. Luckily, characters not participating in battle also gain experience, so you don't have to spend extra time leveling them up. Unlike other RPGs of the past, you can swap out KO'd characters from your party anytime without skipping your turn or needing to res them first. This comes in really handy when going up against a tough battle. The one downside is that dead characters won't gain experience by the end of the battle if they remain dead. While playing RPGs, I usually default to the tank, DPS, and healer archetypes for my party. In Dragon Quest XI, while multiple characters can fill the same roles, characters don't learn the exact same skills as they level up, giving them each a distinctive style. For example, one character may be good at group healing or heal over time effects, but not as strong single target heals or resurrection spells. Each time you level up, you also gain a certain amount of skill points. The early skills don't require much, but the most powerful ones require you to save up or reallocate your points. While some characters can equip the same weapons or equipment, each character has a different skill tree to advance in. You can choose to have a character play a more support role, or you can focus on skills that just increase damage. There are also hidden panels in the skill tree that are generally better and require more of an investment to unlock. But if you decide that you want to reset your skill points, or found a new weapon that you want to specialize in, you can easily visit any save point and spend gold to unlearn them. This is great for those heavy investment skills that turn out to be not as useful as you first expected, such as dual wielding. I always imagine dual wielding to be super epic, and like how my characters look wielding two badass weapons, but I often forget that the offhand weapon does less damage, that together with how much more damage I take without a shield, always has me switching back and forth. All this gave me reasons to play and consistently try out all the characters in the game. One main mechanic of the game that I haven't mentioned yet is the ability to become pepped up during battle and unleash pep powers. After dealing and receiving damage, you will periodically enter a pepped up state, which causes your character to glow and gain increased stats for a few turns. You can cut this effect short by using a pep power. There are a variety of different pep powers you can learn along the way that have a variety of different effects, such as dealing damage to the enemy or buffing certain party members. You can unlock different pep powers through the skill tree, and specific moves require specific members to be pepped up all at the same time. You can unleash truly epic pep powers of more characters that are a part of it, but at the same time you have to determine if that special power is worth using up the temporary buff of being in that pepped up state. Dragon Quest XI is not only a great game for JRPG and Dragon Quest fans, but a stellar game for RPG fans in general. Aside from Persona 5 being my favorite RPG, I would say that Dragon Quest XI is a close second. Now that it's available on most platforms, there's no excuse not to play it. I hope this got you guys interested in the game, or motivated enough to continue playing it. Another thing I almost forgot to mention is that whenever you load up the game, you get a short recap of what was taking place in the story. It really helped me jump back into the game after my schedule got busy and I didn't play for a while. For a lot of games, the more time that passes, the less I want to return, because I feel I might as well start over, or feel the need to watch recap videos without being spoiled. But the game makes it really easy to catch up and pick up where you left off. I can continue to gush about the specific features, moments, or quests I enjoyed, but similar to what I mentioned at the beginning, you'll find more enjoyment if you discover these on your own. So I hope this video helped you. If it did, leave a like, comment, or consider subscribing. So until next time, peace to ya.